So this is uh, the final session uh, of, the, of our symposium. In the afternoon, of course, we're going to have our um, workshops and the one-to-ones. But this is the final session. And uh, what better person to uh, take us over the finish line than uh, Mr. John Scully. And uh, John is one of those people that I think that really requires no introduction. Because if you don't know who John Scully is, you must have been living under a rock for the last 30 years. You know? but, uh, but John we know as uh, somebody who uh, uh, became CEO, of course, of Pepsi, and then uh, took over a small company called Apple, and did some really remarkable things. But if you want to talk about somebody who's been on the forefront of innovation, uh, really, it's going to be John. However, the coolest thing that I think about John is, yes, he's a visionary, but the fact that he can put visions in a manner in which other people can see them even before they're physically formed in front of us is really a gift because that in fact is one of the most difficult things I think uh, for innovators is how do I describe what I see in my mind to other people and, and get them as excited and, and certainly John really is a master of that and so uh, without uh, further ado I'm going to uh, John please come up and uh, share with us. Well, thank you, Jeff. Uh, I have really enjoyed the last couple of days, and it is eye-opening to anybody who is interested in uh, technology and biology. And if I were to go back and be a student today, I would study physics, biology, and data science. I wouldn't study computer science, because actually computer science, in many ways, has become so easy with the tools that you can do a lot of things with MATLAB and others if you understand mathematics. But the really interesting thing, I think, is the uh, convergence of the two vectors of biology and technology coming together and, and the uh, <coughs> insights in terms of what you were doing in labs and where it's all going is just uh, remarkable to me. So I'd like to give you kind of a little reality check. And the reality check is to take you back 30 years ago to 1985, and to give you the perspective of what it's like to be involved in trying to help pivot an industry that had a mindset, and I'm talking about the computer industry, back in 1985, uh, largely around the, the personal computer, uh, and many of the things that happened uh, later in the following decades that became completely obvious to all of us today, but which were not obvious at all even with some of the smartest people back in 1985. Uh, I f first uh, went to Apple, uh, I was interviewed in 1982. And as you know, in high-tech companies like Apple and Google and uh, Microsoft, you have to go through kind of a challenging test as part of the, the um, recruiting process. And so the test I was given was, um, because I wasn't really a technologist. I was coming out of the marketing world, but I'd been in electronics as, just as a kid growing up. I was a ham radio operator at 12, and, and I just loved electronics. And so the test I was given was to take uh, hexadecimal alphanumeric you know, numbers and letters and be able to convert into the binary components equivalents and then to machine code a 6502 8-bit processor. And that was the way that people thought about uh, technology back in the early 1980s. It was all about command line coding. It was an engineer's perspective of the world. Uh, the hierarchy was engineers were at the top of the, the hierarchy in Silicon Valley. Nobody thought about marketing. Consumer marketing didn't really exist in Silicon Valley back in those days. And here I was coming from um, the Cola Wars. So uh, in 1985, uh, the Macintosh had been introduced the year before, in 1984. By 1985, Steve Jobs introduced the Macintosh office, which put together for the first time a, a laser printer and a Macintosh computer and enabled WYSIWYG. What you see on the screen is what you get when you, when you print it out. The problem was Moore's Law. Uh, the processors just weren't fast enough uh, in that time to be able to make this anything more than a novelty, anything that could do more than simple graphic representations of some beautiful postscript fonts, but it took forever to be able to print it out. And people made fun of it. And they said, the Macintosh office is a toy. And Steve 
uh, started to fall into a, a depression over the whole thing. And then he got mad at me, and he said it was all my fault. <laughs> because he said I had forced him to price the Macintosh too high, uh, $500 higher than what he wanted to price it at. And he wanted to shift the money from the Apple II, which was the only cash flow that Apple had at that time, and move the marketing money over to the Macintosh. And I said, Steve, if we do that, we're going to drive this company, we're a public company, into a loss. And we can't do that without going to the board. So we went to the board. The board listened to me. They listened to Steve. They asked Mike Markla, who was the uh, vice chairman of the company and the third co-founder, to go off and study it, separate from Steve and me, talk to the various uh, people throughout Apple that he thought he should talk to, come back, report to the board, not to me, not to Steve, and give him his conclusion. Well, a week later, Mike came back, special board meeting uh, was held, and he said, I agree with John, I don't agree with Steve. The result of that was uh, the board asked Steve to step down from the Macintosh division. Uh, months later, he later resigned from Apple. He was never fired. And the result was that uh, it was a very, very challenging moment because here I was, the non-tech guy from East Coast corporate America in Silicon Valley at a company that had been created by clearly one of the great charismatic visionary uh, co-founders, and he was gone. And I remember Alan Kay, who was an Apple fellow. Alan was one of the uh, original people recruited to Xerox Park, Palo Alto Research Center. And he had created the Dyna book, which was the, uh, really the uh, <clears throat> example of what computers were going to look like years later. This is back in 1971. He had written Smalltalk, the first object-oriented programming language. So he was a pretty recognized smart guy. And he came to me and he said, John, next time we're not going to have Xerox. And I said, well, what, what do you mean, Alan? And he said, well, all of the technologies that Apple used to create first Lisa that failed and later the Macintosh, uh, they all came from Xerox. And he said, we've exploited that. So next time, we've got to have something else. And I said, well, hey, I'm not a technologist. Uh, what do we do? And he said, well, it takes about 20 years for technologies from the time that they are an inspirational idea until they make it all the way through percolating through the labs and systems, and people finally accept them, and they become commercialized, and they become uh, you know, well understood uh, products. And I thought about that, and I said, well, that means, Alan, that there are some ideas that are out there at different stages of that 20-year process, some of them percolating in laboratories around the world. Uh, do you think you could take me around and help me understand uh, what these ideas are that are different stages and, and where this is all going to go? Because we all knew Moore's Law, even back then, we all knew that Moore's Law was going to continually make microprocessors, more powerful, less expensive, and it was going to enable all kinds of new ways to think about information technology. So we did that. And for about a year, uh, when we could find uh, people who would let us in, we would go to <coughs> research labs uh, at universities. We went to Caltech and MIT and Carnegie Mellon and Stanford and uh, uh, Brown University and a number of others. And then we went to uh, various government labs that would let us see things. And we would um, go to companies who would let us in to see things. And from that, uh, Alan came up with a set of uh, descriptive technologies that he said, this is what he thought that the personal computer would look like 20 years later. And so, I was writing a book at that time, and I am a marketing guy, so my role is to package stuff and kind of make it uh, interesting and understandable. I don't invent it. Uh, and so I created this, this uh, description that I called the Knowledge Navigator. And the Knowledge Navigator, we eventually um, turned into a video, because I went to George Lucas, and I said, George, I said, we've got this idea called the Knowledge Navigator of what we think the personal computer can look like in 20 years. But we can't make it. 
There's no technology possible today. You know, could we take some of the special effects that George was doing at that time at Industrial Light and Magic, one of his uh, units uh, up at Lucas Valley Ranch, and could we simulate what this device could look like in 20 years? And he said, yeah, that, that's, that's totally possible. So we created this video. It was all done with special effects. And it was called the Knowledge Navigator. And the reason why I wanted to make that was that I wanted people to believe that even though Steve was not at Apple anymore, that Apple was still going to be a company that was going to take technologies and be able to transform them into things that people were wanting to use. Because the whole vision that Steve Jobs had behind the Macintosh was to create a computer for creative people, non-technical people, that would enable them to be empowered of what he called tools for the mind. And that's what the Knowledge Navigator was. It was what happens after the original Macintosh that Steve created. So I'd like to just show you that video, and then I want to take you through the things that came out of it, and the challenging moments, and the opportunities that laid the foundation for a lot of stuff that came later on. So if we run that video, please. graduate research team in Guatemala, just checking in. Robert Jordan, a second semester junior, requesting a second extension on his term paper. And your mother reminding you about your father's surprise birthday party next Sunday. Today, you have a faculty lunch at 12 o'clock. You need to take Kathy to the airport by 2. You have a lecture at 4.15 on deforestation in the Amazon rainforest. Right. Let me see the lecture notes from last semester. No, that's not enough. I need to review more recent literature. Pull up all the new articles I haven't read yet. Journal articles only? Mm hmm fine. Your friend Jill Gilbert has published an article about deforestation in the Amazon and its effects on rainfall in the Sub-Sahara. It also covers droughts effect on food production in Africa and increasing imports of food. Contact Jill. I'm sorry, she's not available right now. I left a message that you had called. Okay. Let's see. There's an article about five years ago, Dr. Flemson or something. He really disagreed with the direction of Jill's research. John Fleming of Uppsala University. He published in the Journal of Earth Science of July 20 of 2006. Yes, that's it. He was challenging Jill's projection of the amount of carbon dioxide being released to the atmosphere through deforestation. I'd like to recheck his figures. Here is the rate of deforestation he predicted. Mm hmm And what happened? Hmm. He was really off. Give me the university research network. Show only universities with geography nodes. Brazil. Copy the last 30 years at this location at one month intervals. Excuse me, Jill Gilbert is calling back. Great, put her through. Hi Mike, what's up? Jill, thanks for getting back to me. Well, I guess that new grant of yours hasn't dampened your literary abilities. Rumor has it that you've just put out the definitive article on deforestation. Aha. Uh -huh. Is this one of your typical last-minute panics for lecture material? No, 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 no. That's not until, um... 4.15. Well, it's about the effects that reducing the size of the Amazon rainforest can have outside of Brazil. I was wondering, um, it's not really necessary, but, uh... Mm, yes. 
It would be great if you were available to make a few comments. Nothing formal. After my talk, you would come up on the big screen, discuss your article, and then answer some questions from the class. And bail you out again? Well, I think I could squeeze that in. You know, I have a simulation that shows the spread of the Sahara over the last 20 years. Here, let me show you. Nice. Very nice. I've got some maps of the Amazon area during the same time. Let's put these together. Great. I'd like to have a copy of that for myself. Hmm. What happens if we bring down the logging rate to 100,000 acres per year? Hmm. Interesting. I can definitely use this. Thanks for your time, Jill. I really appreciate it. No problem. But next time I'm in Berkeley, you're buying the dinner. Dinner, right. See ya, 4.15. Bye-bye. While you were busy, your mother called again to remind you to pick up the birthday cake. Mm, fine, fine, fine. Um, print this article before I go. Now printing. Okay, I'm going to lunch now. If Kathy calls, tell her I'll be there at 2 o'clock. Also, find out if I can set up a meeting tomorrow morning with um, Tom Lee. Enjoy your lunch. Hello, Professor Bradford is away at the moment. Would you like to leave a message? Michael, this is your mother. I know that you're there. I'm just calling to remind you to call your sister. So that was 1987. 1987, there was no World Wide Web. There were no digital cell phones. In fact, there were no cell phones. They just had, you know, uh, there weren't even bricks then still had something with a handset that was connected to a box uh, for a transceiver. And uh, computers, for the most part, were still alphanumeric. MS-DOS uh, ruled the world. Macintosh was just becoming uh, recognized as something by then Moore's Law. We had the Mac II, and uh, we were able to do things that actually were productive. Uh, we just introduced a desktop presentation and there were a number of things that were inspired by that Knowledge Navigator. I took the Knowledge Navigator around the world. Uh, I remember at Stanford University, there was an incredible debate uh, in the engineering school over the Knowledge Navigator. Some were arguing that that intelligent agent uh, was really uh, not going to be anthropomorphic with a talking figure like that. It was going to be like a prothesis, because Sigourney Weaver had just come out in a movie called Aliens, and she had this prosthetic, uh, you know, super suit, you know, on. And so there were these kinds of, of, of debates, but nobody thought this stuff was real. In fact, they said, what's this guy from corporate America, from Pepsi-Cola, trying to tell us what the computer is going to be like in the future? What does he know? Uh, and so there was a lot of skepticism about where this direction for technology uh, was it really a representation of what was going to happen? And it was also an inspiration for a lot of our smartest people at Apple. So, for example, there was someone named Bill Atkinson, who was the first software programmer ever hired by Apple uh, back when it started. And Bill was an Apple fellow, and he wrote a, uh, a new tool that he, uh, we later called HyperCard, and HyperCard became a prototyping tool that was used broadly, particularly across the university community, on a Macintosh, enabling people to start to do things uh, with radio buttons and graphics and be able to connect to uh, you know, various types of information applications. Remember, there wasn't anything called search in those days. There was no Google. And then uh, there was a, another talented engineer named Steve Perlman. And you couldn't do multimedia. None of the multimedia things you saw in the Knowledge Navigator were possible. So Steve Perlman went off and he invented QuickTime. And QuickTime was the first uh, multimedia 
uh, software engine that could compress and decompress uh, um, all kinds of rich media, including video. And then uh, we started um, a project where uh, Jean-Louis Gasset said, we've got to be able to learn how to deal with 3D geometries and be able to manipulate them in, three, in real time. So it's hard to believe, but we went out and we bought a Cray XMP48 supercomputer and installed it for $28 million. Uh, that was 50 MIPS. 50 MIPS is less than what you get in a Fitbit watch. <laughs> $28 million. We installed that and we took a Mac 2 and we connected it using HyperCard so that we could manipulate 3D geometry. And I'll never forget Sally Ride, who was uh, on our board at that time, going in and playing with it. And she said, this is incredible. Being, and she'd been up in space. She thought this was just as incredible, being able to manipulate you know, 3D geometries on a computer screen. And then there was um, a project we started called Newton. And Newton turned out to be a commercial uh, failure in the marketplace. There were things that just weren't um, good enough in it with its handwriting recognition. But some really interesting things came out of the Newton. Uh, we needed a floating point, low-powered processor. Floating points necessary to do you know, any kind of graphic intensive applications. And we were just moving into object-oriented programming in those, those days. So we set up a team uh, outside of, of uh, MIT at uh, One Kendall Square. And we started working with a really talented team over in uh, the UK at Cambridge University, headed by Herman Hauser. And we co-developed a new microprocessor for specifically for Newton. All the instruction sets were written uh, to do the kinds of things we wanted to do to do uh, graphics and multimedia on a handheld device without a keyboard. And this project was called ARM. And that was the beginning of the ARM processor. Well, Newton was not commercially successful. Handwriting didn't work. But the ARM processor today is in roughly six billion mobile devices in, in the world. And we take it for granted. And the ARM core is used in, in many other applications, including uh, the Internet of Things. So uh, the lessons we learned here was some of our most talented people got interested. They were inspired by this abstraction, because the thing that was missing when you're dealing with command line uh, devices, alphanumeric uh, uh, text and, and, and um, numbers and letters is the only way to sort of communicate. You remember when Philip Alvelda showed that uh, Apple II connected over a 300 baud modem on the first, first day, the green screens was how everything looked, you know, back in, in the mid-1980s. And so when you're looking at the things in the Knowledge Navigator, it's higher levels of abstraction. And that's why I said computer science would not be what I would be interested in today, because the abstraction layers have gotten so uh, high that you can write in scripts. You don't have to be a programmer writing. In my era, it was assembly language. You don't need to write in assembly or C. Uh, you can write at very high levels. And you're really focused more on the things you can do and connections and communication. So what was inside the Knowledge Navigator that was so inspiring? It was thinking about the computer as a, an abstraction for how you could communicate. It was an abstraction of how you could simulate. And what Alan Kay taught me was that you have to think about the computer not in terms of its components, but you think about it systemically in terms of how these things go together. Particularly, it's a simulation machine. It's all about simulating. And it's taking data in from all different types of data sources and data types. Well, we went on to develop other things that came out of the Knowledge Navigator. Uh, we started a company called General Magic. And General Magic was before the World Wide Web. So we put together a joint venture with Sony and AT&T and, and Apple to fund it. And some of our most talented engineers were the founders of, of the company. And out of that company came some really interesting people. You might recognize one of them, Tony Fidel. Now. Uh, founder of Nest, acquired by Google. 
Um, Megan Smith, uh, now the Chief Technology Officer for the United States uh, Administration, uh, formerly uh, at uh, Google. Um, you might uh, recognize the name uh, Pierre uh, Amadar, who was the founder of eBay. He was a programmer in, inside of that, that company. And so a lot of really talented people you know, came out of these projects, Newton, uh, General Magic, Hypercard, uh, QuickTime, that ended up you know, playing significant roles in what computing as we know it is, is today. So now I've put that into the context of what we've been talking about over the last two days. And the context to me, the takeaways to me, was that when we think of genomics and proteomics, that it isn't just about the era of discovery. It's about that we've moved into the era of being able to build things and being able to edit DNA and being able to do the constructs where you can actually go and take, as we heard uh, yesterday, to take uh, you know, yeast or to take E. coli uh, uh, DNA and being able to convert that using tools into different kinds of products uh, was absolutely fascinating to me. And then today what I loved about the presentations was we got into the whole world of data analytics. And uh, big data analytics, in fact, uh, my co-founding partner, David Steinberg, is here on the next panel. And he and I founded a company uh, which is called Zeta Interactive. We're one of the largest big data analytics companies in the world. We're headquartered here in New York, about 700 people. And the role of big data in marketing, the face, place we're focused on, is well understood. But the role of big data and the way it was so brilliantly described in the presentations today of thinking about it uh, systemically and thinking about the complexity of dealing with diseases, not by describing them in their traditional nomenclature, but thinking about them in terms of the complexity of data and the way in which you can extract you know, entirely new insights and be able to build models at different levels of abstraction and compare it with, with other data of other individuals and you start to look at the correlations between the data and what that means for synthetic biology and what it means to think of uh, biology as I, I immediately was uh, struck by uh, when one of the presenters said that uh, biology is both chemistry but it's also information science. It's sort of like Einstein said, you know, uh, light is a particle, but light is a wave. I mean, you start to think about these things and you say, wow, the world of precision medicine is gonna be dramatically different. But the message I would leave you with is that as obvious as it is to everybody in this room, where precision medicine is going and the brilliant things that are going on with DARPA-sponsored projects, Jeff. Uh, and it's pretty clear that the future is gonna just be spectacular. I can almost guarantee that the incumbent parties in the healthcare and medical industry and the special interests in various constituent groups, whether it be from the disciplines of computer science or from biology or from chemistry or from the government or wherever it happens to be, that it will not be a, a, a ride that won't have a few bumps along the way. And so there are many people in this room who are going to be able to see precision medicine when it's fully implemented and well understood. It's going to be as obvious in the future that precision medicine is what medicine is as it's obvious today of what we think of in terms of the types of devices we have and the systems we have, the tools we have you know, in the world of computer science. So I'm just really excited to be invited, Jeff, to, to come and first listen to the uh, incredible two days that you've put together and to be able to at least share with you the perspective of having been through this in a different industry uh, to say that there's a lot of you know, hope that 
the future will be an exciting one in this industry as well. Thank you.